that first opening riff just blew both of us away. And I didn't want to say anything, and, and the bass player said to me, well, what are you going to do? And I said, I guess I have to go. He said, yeah, I guess you do. Tony Harnell from TNT. Um, went over there, I was there a week later, get passport, I had to do all that stuff, and kind of rewrote the, the songs to fit my voice a little better, because the singer that started the band had a little bit of a different range from me, and uh, developed the melodies and the lyrics, um, since he was Norwegian, some of the lyrics were a little bit, you know, I don't know, I just didn't want to sing them, so I changed some things, and I went in and, and recorded two songs a day, I was done in about a week, and I thought it would only come out in Norway. And, <clears throat> you know, they mixed the album and little by little by little, it spread. And the guy in Norway sent it to the guy in Holland and he sent it to the guy in Germany and then it just started to grow. And before I knew it, I was back in New York and I got a phone call um, from the head of A&R at Mercury in New York saying he wanted to sign the band for, world, for the world, for a world, worldwide deal. And um, I just didn't expect it. I thought I'd go do the record, come back and join my New York band, and that would be sort of a helpful thing for that band. And so that's how it started. And we started a tour right away. Um, did a, a, a tour, a little tour in America with the Rods. Um, and then we were in Norway doing a winter tour uh, that was 20 shows in 25 days or something crazy. And, um, and we were off and running. So, yeah. Well, actually what happened was uh, we put out Intuition and it did amazingly. It, that's when we blew up in Japan. So then that became our next big market was, um, it, you know, the joke, everybody's big in Japan. But we really like, I remember getting the phone call from our manager of you guys like are top 10, not on the rock charts, but the pop charts. And, um, and we put, a, we put a tour on sale and the whole tour sold out in 30 minutes. And these were like 7,500 seaters, you know. So that was really exciting for the band because we, we went to Japan and it was just like the Beatles. We got off the plane and it's just like every, just crazy people following us and grabbing at our hair, you know. It was like the first time we experienced, other than Norway, first time we experienced that kind of insanity. Um, and even, even with the big tours in the U.S. that we did with Striper and, and Twisted Sister and Great White, and, uh, we were doing well, but we never experienced that that manic mania kind of you know thing that we experienced in uh, Norway and Japan at our peak so intuition was a big record for us in Japan and it did about the same numbers in uh, America that Tell No Tales did Tell No Tales is always the one people remember us for over here but um, you're talking about the transition from uh, from intuition which was Mercury Records and we left Mercury and we went over to Atlantic Records and we did Realize Fantasies. That was a weird period for us, uh, not only internally, because it took us two years to make the record, we made it with the wrong producer and uh, um, it was just very, we had reached a certain level where we kind of really now wanted to, you know, this was it, this is now, this is our moment, we have to, you know, new label, a lot of money was behind us and we needed to blow up and um, a lot of pressure so we took a long time to do the record and uh, finally it was ready and um, we got everything together and it came out in 92 and I think from my memory what I remember and I could be off here was the timing of the release was very 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 close to the timing of the of when Smells Like Teen Spirit hit MTV and um, every record we had done up to that point we had done two to three music videos for MTV for each album well we finished that album for Atlantic and they were all excited and everything and we had singles we thought and good ballads everybody's putting out ballads you know no video so that was the first kind of indicator that something was weird and uh, they shipped a decent amount of records, sold them all out real quick because the last record had done so well. And then that was kind of it. 
um, it, we just sort of, it just went away. It <laughs> just kind of, there was Nirvana, and this was, you know, boom, there they were, and our album came out, and then just kind of, just kind of faded away. And then we sort of broke up very quickly after that. I remember we went to Japan, did a very successful tour, uh, following up the one before that, and uh, came home feeling good about the tour because it sold out, you know. And, and we got home and everybody was sort of, what else do we, what do we do now? And the, no one, the label wasn't interested in really working the record anymore. And uh, I came home and MTV, it was like Nirvana. Everybody was talking about Nirvana. So that, that was, now oddly, um, most of my peers really hated that whole explosion. And before I get into the other bands and talk about, you know, Alice in Chains and Soundgarden and all that stuff, I mean, for me, when I saw that video, I knew that it was the beginning of the end for what we were doing. Um, but I loved it. And I, and I, you know, I do these interviews all the time and I talk to fans and they'll say, oh, I hate grunge because it killed hair metal, or, you know, which again is another term I absolutely hate because I don't consider my band to fall into that. Yes, we had a lot of hair, and yes, we all kind of looked the same in, in terms of the clothes, we had the same designers, and if you look at a picture with all the bands, uh, which they do sometimes, they'll put like these collages of all the 80s bands together on a big thing. Yeah, I mean, who's who? I mean, I even look at a, someone's picture and say, is that us, you know? Um, but, uh, I don't think that grunge killed, you know, 80s hard rock. Let's call it that. Let's not call it hair metal. Let's say 80s hard rock. It's not grunge that killed it. It's, too, it's the labels, too many signings, and it's all of those signings that came at the, in the late 80s into the early 90s of just any band with long hair, with a pretty singer and a good guitar player that had, you know, decent songs and they were just like signing, 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 signing. And I think it was just too much. MTV was just loaded with all that and everybody kind of started to sound the same. Uh, that's what was great about, there was an era around, you know, our first record came out in 84, 80, 85 in America. So we were sort of on the, you know, beginning of the whole thing. Uh, once he started to hit, and then 87, I would say, when we had Tell No Tales out and Guns N' Roses came out and Bon Jovi had Slippery When Wet out and, I mean, and, and Whitesnake had their big record out. That was kind of the, you know, big, I, I would say, when everything was kind of, there were bands that were kind of different from each other. Whitesnake was awesome and had their own sound. Guns N' Roses was amazing and they had their own thing and you had, uh, I guess Poison, you know, which was like the glammy band. You had Motley Crue killing it, you know, with their, you know, their thing. And, um, and you had more of the musical bands like TNT and uh, Yngwie and, uh, uh, you know, I can't think of everybody, but you know, there, there was a nice mixture. And then all of a sudden, a couple of years later, into 89 and 90 and 91, there was just this full, you know, just flood of signings and, a lot of great bands, don't get me wrong, there were some good ones in there, but just too many. And I just think that's what killed it, more than grunge coming along. If they had kept it more like the 70s, where you ha or that, mid that period I just talked about, where you had you know, 70s hard rock, you had Aerosmith on one hand, Kiss on the other hand, Foreigner, uh, UFO, you know, there was just so much diversity, Ted Nugent and ACDC, and there was just a lot of different sounding hard rock bands, Deep Purple, Led Zeppelin, you know, uh, Queen. Um, and everybody was very distinct, but they fell under the hard rock category. And I can go on and on naming bands, but you get the idea. And that's what made it work, is they could all coexist. Uh, but by the time that, that last push of signings came, I couldn't tell any, you know, I, I they all kind of just blend in and that was not the case, uh, you know, in the 70s hard rock era and even in that period I talked about in the mid, mid, middle, late 87, 88 period. So um, anyway, that's my answer, my long answer. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think they do that every, 
every era, I mean, in, in a way. I think the only time that they maybe didn't do that was the 70s, was, you know, they kind of let each band have their, their thing and they were a little more picky, I would say. Um, you had your, you know, you had those different categories, like you had sort of the corporate rock, I guess they called it, but I love that stuff, like a, what a, AOR rock, um, Foreigner Journey, you know, those kinds of bands. Uh, and then you had uh, Cheap Trick and you had bands like that. But yeah, I think, I do think it happened again in the 90s. I think that it started to happen probably around the time uh, Stone Temple Pilots came along, which again, in the beginning, I think everybody was like, oh, this is kind of like Pearl Jam B. Well, we now know they weren't. We now know that they were a great band with a, that stood on their own and they stood the test of time as they put each record out. But, but after them, it just kind of was like, okay, anybody that, you know, saying kind of like that was like, you know, and War Flannel was, was cool. And it just started to get sort of, you know, dull and, the, and ra rock radio just sounded kind of, again, it was again, it was like the beginning of the 90s was exciting. The end of the 90s was like, ugh, you know, and then the pop thing came, the boy band thing and the Britney Spears thing and all that stuff started to happen. So I think, again, I think that was a reaction to, you know, everything seems to be in music seems to be a reaction to oversaturating something, you know, and you just like kill something to death and you just, oh, the, you know, I know the A&R guys in the 70s must have just, they were just way smarter. The idea was, that you were supposed to have your own sound. And if you sounded too much like anyone else that was on their roster or on anyone else's roster, they were, they, and they liked you, they were working with you with the songs and the production and the sound to not sound like who you sounded like. And um, that changed at some point. Somewhere around the late 70s, I guess probably the thing that I would say was the most same samey was the disco thing and and then it went into the 80s a little bit and then it just you know so at those those 70s 60s and 70s a and r guys had it right was we want something that reminds us maybe of something but has its own place you know and its own original thing and that got lost along the way and i really think that's what's killed uh music is these a and r guys as soon as one thing blows up we want another one that's totally the wrong attitude, you know. Yeah. No, we want something as good, but totally different.